Welcome to the New Books Network. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to New Books in Environmental Studies, a podcast channel on the New Books Network. I'm your host, Isabel Aikman, and today we'll be talking to Professor Helen Curry about her new book, Endangered Maze, Industrial Agriculture and the Crisis of Extinction. Thank you, Helen, for joining me today. It's fantastic to have you on the podcast. Thanks very much for the invitation. I'm, I'm looking forward to the conversation today. Great. So could you start off by telling us a little bit about yourself and your research interests and how you came to the topic of endangered maize? Sure, I'd be delighted to. Well, I'm the uh, Melvin Kranzberg Professor in the History of Technology at the Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta in the United States. And I uh, am or consider myself, broadly speaking, a historian of science and technology in the recent past. Uh, And what that has meant for me is looking especially at the history of uh, the life sciences and uh, biotechnological developments and change as they have intersected with especially agricultural development. So uh, a significant um, amount of my time and research in the past has um, been really centered on thinking about about plant breeding, about how research scientists and other individuals go about creating new new kinds of of crops and uh, vegetables and flowers and so on. Uh, And then more recently and more related to the book that we're going to be talking about today, I've been thinking about what one might kind of think of as the the flip side of uh, plant breeding, uh, which tends to sort of set plants and crops in particular tracks. Um, I've been thinking about uh, efforts to conserve diversity uh, in, uh, to conserve uh, genetic diversity in in crop plants, especially. Uh, And so this is the effort to not winnow down plants to a perfect form, as we might think of in plant breeding, but really see what diversity is out there in the world. Think about um, uh, where it is, why it might be used, and especially how it might be um, um, conserved in order to be drawn upon in the future in various different ways. Uh, so, so my my yeah my research interests have have been uh, on plant breeding and its various kind of uses and also consequences in the world. Yeah, they're brilliant ideas to drive research. And looking at kind of one particular species is such a great way of bringing plants into historical writing. Um, and you're reading your book, it's it's clear that maize is such a fascinating plant to choose as a protagonist because it's so foundational to our global food system. Um, but I'll be completely honest and say that I had hardly any knowledge about maize before reading this book. And I was hoping that you could give us a high level character profile of maize and speak to what a study of maize can reveal about our understanding of biological diversity and extinction. Yeah. So, well, let me sort of take a step back in some ways to talk about, so in, um, as I said, just in characterizing my research, I've been interested in efforts to conserve crop diversity. And when I really started out on that project, I, I was thinking in really uh, general terms. I wasn't interested in maize specifically, but I was thinking about efforts to, to conserve crop diversity more generally, whether that was um, seed banking, so, so putting seeds in long-term storage or medium-term storage uh, to make sure that certain lines continue, uh, or whether it's seed saving, something that someone might carry on in their, their backyard or in their farm from season to season, uh, or any, anything really kind of in between those two, those two extremes of, of keeping seeds extant from season to season. Um, and so I was interested in, you know, uh, thinking about apples and thinking about wheat and, and rice and all of these other things. Um, but it, it quickly became apparent in trying to tell this history, one, that, you know, as is so often the case in, in writing history, there was a <laughs> it was a bit too big of a story uh, to try and 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 explore in 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 just one book. Uh, thinking about that that great big landscape of of crop diversity and what that might mean, um, but it also was the case that maize or corn, uh, especially as as it's referred to in the United States, uh, kept cropping up as uh, a, a plant that was important in thinking about how conservation would take shape, why it mattered, who would be the targets, um, uh, where things would be preserved, and, and, and so on, and in, in what modes. And so um, 
That might be because I was coming at this, uh, having been trained as a U.S. historian. Um, perhaps if I had been working in an Asian context, I would have zoomed in on rice as the, the crop that had the most to say about these particular issues. But being an Americanist, uh, 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 that brings me really to your question of, of corn and why, uh, why it's so important in this story. Um, it's obviously one of the top three uh, global crops, along with uh, wheat and rice. By some measures, it is the, the world's most produced crop. Uh, and it is, you know, fundamentally important to the global economy today, has been for a couple of centuries, to um, uh, political economy as well, to the ways in which um, nations have related to each other in terms of food aid and other kinds of um, uh, kind of exchange relationships. And I can talk a, a bit more about that. Um, but even more fundamentally, it has this incredibly long history in the Americas as a kind of cultural foundation, um, especially in Mexico, where maize originated, but also in other uh, Latin American countries. And so this cultural significance, this economic importance, uh, really meant that there were many people who converged on wanting to conserve maize uh, and uh, create structures for the continuance of maize diversity for a variety of different reasons to serve different communities and different agendas. Um, and that's really one of the reasons why I think it, it proved so productive uh, uh, in the book. It's certainly not the only story that one could tell about the history of efforts to conserve crop diversity, but it is, it is one important lens. Yes, and, and talking about the relationships between different communities and different people. Um, so who are the organisations and communities that shape the history here? Who are you focused in on during your research? Well, as a historian of science, my main agenda in writing this book was to really understand uh, certain kinds of research traditions coming out of, uh, coming out of a professional science community. So my starting point uh, was really thinking about uh, professional plant breeders or commercial seed sellers, uh, geneticists, plant biologists, um, taxonomists, uh, and, and so on, a, a, a community of researchers um, and crop developers who were interested um, in corn, not chiefly from a perspective of their own culture or their own, um, um, you know, daily subsistence, except maybe in the sense of, of you know, the source of their salary, um, but uh, interested in it more with this lens of uh, kind of science and, and, and economics. And I wanted to understand the actions that, that they had taken uh, over, over about a century uh, in order to explore and document and, and um, save uh, genetic diversity in maize. But of course, in telling that story, uh, the principal groups that, that, that they interacted with in those efforts were uh, individuals growing corn um, and chiefly individuals growing corn that were characterized as being kind of pre-industrial. So that in, in the story that I tell is um, uh, indigenous communities of the Americas, um, really from the United States uh, all the way through uh, Central, well, through Mexico, then through Central America and, and South America as well. Um, and so I followed the professional communities that had been my kind of chief entry point uh, as, a, as a historian of science uh, through their engagement with various different cultures of corn cultivation, uh, subsistence, and also uh, ultimately conservation as well. Brilliant. And you speak about kind of the, the century and the developments that happen over that century. We should say that we're talking about the, the 20th century and your book is broadly chronological. So you know, we start in, I think, 1916 with Harold Bigger in the Office of Corn Investigation. And then we end with these international agreements about the turn of the century. So could you draw out some of the key developments that you found whilst researching the book and what you follow throughout it? Yeah, so I think there's a, a few different ways to to break down what are the what are the different timelines that matter in the book. One is probably in terms of plant breeding methods and tools and ideas. 
so at the turn um, of the 20th century, so in the, the late um, 1800s and early 1900s, uh, corn cultivation in the United States, where the, where the book um, starts, uh, was really primarily uh, centered on um, producing grain, especially to feed livestock, uh, and, and doing so using um, what we call open pollinated varieties, so freely interbreeding populations of maize that might have clear varietal names, um, but would be a sort of combination of sometimes purchased on the market and sometimes seed saved on the farm by the farmer. Um, and there was a lot of interest in helping farmers improve their methods of saving seed, um, but also um, developing new kinds of uh, varieties that would be suited to different farming conditions around the United States uh, at, at that moment in time. Um, and what that latter trend, that trend of producing new lines to, to spread to farmers really contributed to was um, an idea that things that farmers had grown before that they might have been saving on their farms, um, um, saving as seed from year to year, or that might only have a kind of regional specificity would be gradually eliminated um, as the products of professional breeders and commercial seed companies uh, came more and more to predominate. This is a concern that had been around um, actually, I think probably a bit earlier in, in Europe and in other places. Um, but uh, uh, this is this is the the sort of moment where we start to see these concerns coalesce a little bit in the United States, um, and so uh, with thinking about corn improvement uh, or corn breeding and its intensification, uh, the next real step uh, is uh, the development of hybrid corn, um, and that's a, a a method of producing. Um, uh, corn varieties for um, uh, for planting and production by farmers that took the step of seed saving out of the hands of the farmer um, for for basically biological reasons that have to do with um, hybrids F1 hybrid seeds specifically not um, reproducing uh, true uh, from from generation to generation and and so along with this transition to hybrid corn you then see actually the kind of intensification of um, professional and commercial development of corn seed varieties which intensifies this concern about um, whether uh, older varieties will indeed disappear as farmers make a transition um, and so the first part of the book really tracks that piece of, of history um, and, uh, uh, and then follows uh, the concerns, especially of professional breeders and geneticists, as they observe a transition to hybrid corn and to the purchase of commercial corn seed in the United States, and then project that same trajectory in the United States to Mexico. Uh, to Central and South America uh, to, to start to have a concern about farmers uh, across the Americas who have traditionally cultivated incredibly diverse uh, 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 strains and varieties of maize, um, about that diversity possibly being winnowed down um, and as a result, no longer available to scientists and, and breeders of the future. That's really the concern. So then I'll just say, um, and then I, I know that I've sort of, there's another answer to your question that I'm missing, but um, if we think about that trajectory, then, you know, the next big um, shift in the terms of, in terms of um, uh, plant breeding technologies has to do with uh, the introduction of genetically modified seeds and the way in which that sparks different kinds of activism and, and agitation around uh, the spread of commercial seed varieties, especially in, in Mexico, um, where they're perceived to be particularly threatening to, um, to, to, to native um, uh, varieties of maize. And so I, I deal with that history as well. So, that's, so there's a whole kind of thread of events that have to do with um, plant breeding technologies. Uh, but at the same time, I think there's also a, 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 a timeline to understand that's about ideas about um, indigenous peoples um, or uh, local communities and uh, notions of development uh, and uh, the idea that uh, um, uh, certain groups of people around the world are um, 
practicing means of farming and cultivation that should be quote unquote improved uh, or developed uh, in the in the language of development theory into quote unquote modern methods. Uh, and so we can also track uh, the history of changing ideas about where and when corn varieties might disappear and why that would be a concern, not just along this trajectory of plant breeding technologies, but also ideas about development. So, um, and this in, in the book stretches from Native American farmers uh, in the American West, especially uh, in the early 20th century, um, who are uh, seen to be disappearing uh, in the midst of economic change uh, uh, by observers at the U.S. Department of Agriculture and elsewhere, to concerns about indigenous groups elsewhere in the Americas uh, and the ways in which change happening uh, in, in um, their communities might be causing them to, again, this is the, the perception, not the reality, but to, to kind of disappear out of existence. Um, Two ideas about uh, global development after World War II, this idea that, you know, uh, actors from the United States should actively be going out into the world to modernize, as it were, um, uh, peoples and communities and and approaches to agriculture that they find elsewhere. Uh, And the ideas about radical transformation and, and loss and disappearance that are caught up with that. So that, I would say, is the other kind of timeline of major events that's that's important in the story. And just to pick up more on that, I really enjoyed the way that you brought the wider political context into the narrative, uh, especially the Cold War and the global economic changes. And this seemed especially important when discussions about genetic resources and access became global. Could you give us a feel for those key political developments and contexts that influenced this story? So I think here it's important to start in some ways where my last comment left off with um, uh, the immediate aftermath of World War II um, and to think about the the development um, of the the UN system, I would say, and different UN agencies as sites where um, global concerns uh, could be negotiated in, in, in distinctive ways. Um, And so one of the shifts that's important um, in how the conservation of biodiversity comes to be a a, a global concern, so not necessarily an issue just of plant breeders and geneticists who think they're losing raw materials for future development, um, but actually a concern about, uh, yeah, as as you've just said, it kind of global genetic resources um, that could be dissipated and, and this being a problem for future generations, for all of of humanity, that's really caught up with um, um, the rise of environmentalism in many different contexts around the world in the the 1960s and early 1970s, especially, and the existence of global fora. So the UN Food and Agriculture Organization is a key institutional actor in this story. uh, also, I would say organizations like um, the United Nations Environment Program uh, and, and the United Nations Development Program. These are spaces where, uh, well, I mean, we refer to genetic resources, but often what people f- quite frankly mean are seeds, seeds of, of, of diverse varieties um, that are thought to be useful in, in various different ways. Um, but these these um, global fora are a place where the control of and access to seeds as um, um, you know a resource for humanity come to be uh, discussed and and really kept on the high on a on a global environmental agenda uh, right up until the present day. And just picking up on on the seeds, something I found really interesting was the story of seed banks especially your observation that they were political and not biological. And there were these huge debates about what they should be used for and who should have access to the benefits. Uh, Could you give us an understanding of when seed banks first appeared and why they're created? And more about what the inherent power dynamics with seed banks were? I think this is a great question. And I've my sort of opinion and assessment of it has changed over time. I used to try and 
put a pinpoint on when seed banks were invented, but it's really probably easiest to envision the seed bank as uh, a sort of entity existing on a continuum um, and sort of coming into existence on that same uh, trajectory. Um, But a seed bank is really at its core, just a collection, an organized collection of um, uh, samples representing crop diversity generally saved as seed, right? And so the seed bank in a way was invented long before any of these ideas of conservation uh, came to be prevalent. If we think about communities or even individuals or farmers saving seeds um, and and perhaps having samples of different varieties or different um, um, populations to, to maintain over time. But we might want to contest that and say, actually, there was a moment in time in which long-term conservation became the agenda of, of a seed bank, right? That it wasn't just about having resources for the next season. It was about having resources 30 years from now and 75 years from now and 200 years from now, or in the, the case of, you know, small, the Svalbard Global Seed Belt, much longer than that still. And so we might think, when did seed collections come to have this conservation agenda? Um, and I think that is really about the, the, the turn of the 20th century, um, except that it wasn't really actualized very well in many places um, or in the places where, where people attempted it that attempted it. And that's chiefly because actually maintaining a seed bank, especially if your interest is in the long term, and especially before refrigeration possibilities were what they are today, or freezing possibilities, um, keeping a seed bank is actually quite a bit of work. Seeds are living materials that eventually die in storage. And so it's not just about having the vision for for creating a collection of seeds. It's also having the plan for how to regenerate uh, those seeds when they reach a point in their lifespan that they're, they're not likely to continue. Um, and, uh, and because, because seed banks, uh, effective long-term conservation seed banks need to have these material resources. Um, I think this is a, a huge part of what makes them such a political issue, right? Because what happens in the 1970s when there seems to be this general agreement that uh, crop genetic resources are being lost in the midst of global development, Uh, these are important resources for food, for agriculture, for the future. Um, At that moment in time, the places in the world that have the most effective long-term conservation seed banks um, are a handful of industrialized nations uh, or institutions closely allied with uh, those countries. And so it is a it is a question of global equity, right? So uh, making sure that there would be access to something routinely described by scientists in the 1970s as a, as a kind of patrimony of humanity, uh, that becomes a, a, a major issue. Um, and, uh, and so that's how the, the sort of um, concept of a seed bank and the biological work that it that it needs to do comes to intersect with a question about yeah I think fundamentally uh, equity and access to resources yeah it was very interesting to realize how much work goes into managing these seed banks and how so many of the seeds are actually lost because they can't be replaced with enough to, with enough time um, and one of the convincing arguments of your book was that seed banks work best when they're part of in situ conservation as well. And they're kind of part of this revolving use of seeds uh, with local communities. Um, So I was wondering if you could speak to that and speak about how conservation has changed and the idea of conservation has changed through these technologies and through these practices. Yeah. So um, in the, in the period of time that I was just talking about a moment ago in the, in the 1970s, especially um, and, and, and 1980s, um, the a pretty effective system for inter- conservation of cru- crop genetic resources perceived to be crucial uh, across different uh, national contexts was was really forged, um, and you know it was contested and challenged, and questions about access and equity um, that I was mentioning were um, um, sort of. 
managed and brokered in different ways. Um, but it wasn't just the political um, challenges that proved actually to, to, to um, transformative to uh, ideas about seed banking. So there was um, the, the mobilization, mobilization to set seed banks up. There was uh, the negotiation over who should be able to access these and how they should be managed at an international level. Um, but then as evidence started to mount that it was challenging for these, these now kind of international institutions to actually keep up with uh, the influx of materials that um, were going into them. And as other questions about the agenda of, of global development and who, who ultimately it, it, it served um, kind of were playing out in the, in the 1980s and 1990s, uh, there really came to be a, a strong counter initiative in the world of efforts to conserve crop diversity, which was based on the idea that the ultimate conservators and the most effective conservative conservators of crop diversity are, are farmers. And they are farmers who have incentives to continue to grow uh, different varieties, um, uh, whether for you know, to, to, to fit an economic niche, uh, to fulfill a specific subsistence aim that they have or to serve uh, other uses. Um, and so uh, you mentioned, I think, um, the notion of, of in situ. So that's sort of on site or on farm conservation um, really started to gather a lot of momentum, I would say, in the 1990s, um, as especially social scientists, um, but also agroecologists and ethnobotanists um, began to work much more closely with farmers in um, especially marginalized contexts, so not necessarily in the heart of uh, uh, economic agricultural or global economic agricultural production, but of course, folks perhaps um, um, unfairly excluded from those contexts, uh, who might have uh, more reasons to be uh, cultivating uh, a variety of, of different um, crop types uh, to see those. So, so, so researchers and, and other actors started to see those farmers as really, um, a, a, I think in some cases, just an alternate path, but in some cases, actually a, a, a better path to, to conservation um, and a better path in, in part because of the way in which conservation could then be linked to uh, addressing other kinds of um, needs with respect to, to social justice and, and equality, right? So ensuring that farmers who wanted to continue working the land uh, would have the resources to be able to do that. Um, and uh, or to make sure that um, groups who had in a previous era been sort of the story had been written about them disappearing, right? Um, as we see, um, especially in, in sort of accounts of, of the history of the United States and how uh, Native Americans in the U.S. were perceived um, for so long uh, in order to, to kind of rewrite a narrative of, of continuity, of resilience, of resistance, of growth. Um, and so, so uh, in situ conservation, on-farm conservation was also not just caught up with these ideas about biological conservation, but I think much more with ideas about, about social justice and how conservation uh, could also serve that agenda. And those relationships between the way that we think about biology and the way that we think about society seems to be so linked throughout throughout all of the um, all of the events that you look at throughout the book, um, and these imaginings of endangerment and the societies of local communities, which seem to you say be seen as inherently endangered, um, and that kind of shapes the way that organisations approach crop diversity management as well. And I was hoping you could speak to your kind of final argument in the book that crop diversity and human diversity are inherently intertwined and therefore might must be protected together, if you could speak more about that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, for me, this point was kind of the revelation of, of writing this book. Um, as I've said before, starting out as a historian of science and technology and really being interested in the, the plant breeding, uh, the crop science, the biotechnology, um, and delving into this history, um, 
with that sort of those blinders on already, um, and then increasingly observing my actors having a blindness about the fact that they were actually dealing with farmers um, and with communities and cultures um, and being uh, kind of, in a way, <laughs> um, astonished by that. Uh, how, could, how could collectors from the United States who were going out to find maize in, in, in Mexico in the 1940s write a whole book uh, about the diversity of maize that didn't even attempt to deal with the diversity of humans, uh, uh, the diversity of farmers and farms and the diversity of cuisine. And I was shocked by that. And then, of course, I had to reflect on my own um, way of going about this history, which was to start with precisely the same kind of questions as the, as the actors that I had. Um, and so uh, what I hope has come out more in the end is, is, is what you described in terms of um, actively thinking about what some of these sort of strictly you know, plant science based or um, strictly uh, plant taxonomy uh, uh, inflected visions of researchers, what they were, what they were missing, right? What the world that they were actually engaging with was um, not a world necessarily just of plants, um, but a world of, of people and plants together. Um, and so what happens if we put that other part of the story back in? Um, uh, to our accountings. And then that also, of course, plays into to where I conclude the book in reflecting on um, how we might rethink actually the, the sort of project of conservation um, in order to uh, account for, for, uh, for some of the, the, the kind of failings of past actors, uh, some of those blindnesses that they might have had uh, to the, the, the worlds that they were encountering. Yeah, you really speak to a problem which I think is prevalent for a lot of historians in kind of reassessing the way that you go about your research and making sure that you don't have the same biases that you're kind of assigning to the characters that you're studying as well. Um, so yeah, it's difficult. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And I think, you know, I think one of the things that I want to make absolutely clear in this interview and, and that I, again, I hope really comes through in the text is, is the extent to which a lot of um, the, the ideas that I put forward there, especially in the, in the conclusion are the places where a lot of conservation or crop conservation geneticists are at today with respect to thinking about um, conservation in motion, conservation in change, right? That um, we need, we need our crop plants to be dynamic. We need our research to be dynamic to reflect that. Um, and so those sort of um, ideas that that the history brought me to are also, you know, the the ideas that that today's conservationists are are really dealing with. Mm. Yeah, I mean, obviously this is a history book, but the history of crops and biodiversity is such an important context for the current environmental situation. Um, is there anything else that you? like to add to where you see your research contributing to our current understanding of biodiversity and providing insight into how we should approach it? Well, so I think there's two things. One is what I just mentioned. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm struck by the extent to which it's difficult to think about conservation because in other areas of biodiversity conservation, we are like absolutely tethered to the story of loss. There is dramatic species loss. There is habitat loss. Um, there is, you know, the depletion of uh, uh, resources, right? The depletion of, of global forests. And so, and so conservation is really wrapped up in a story which is about loss. Crop to genetic diversity is a little bit different because um, we can also think about creating diversity, creating diversity through new combinations, through uh, cultivation over time, which drives populations in different directions, right? So it is, it is um, uh, a kind of a different kind of enterprise. And I think uh, if there's, you know, a, a place for this story that I'm telling here to really be a reminder that, that we can't just be telling stories of loss, at least not in this area of biodiversity conservation, because that limits us to, 
a notion of, you know, finite heritage, for example, um, uh, or this idea that, you know, heirlooms, these are things that existed in the past and we steward them to the future. Um, actually, we can, we can be thinking about how to restore diversity uh, and grow diversity. And, and that's important too. Um, yeah. And I, I think maybe, well, maybe I'll stop there on, on, on that point. Yeah, I think throughout the book, it is it does feel like a story of optimism in the end. Um, you come to the end of it and you feel like there is something that can be done and we're learning more about how to manage landscapes and biodiversity protection. Um, so that is very refreshing, I think, um, in the story of environmentalism. I'm glad you um, you uh, felt that way. I think it was important to me uh, that 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 a story that I think involves, you know, talking about discrimination, prejudice, marginalization, uh, all, you know, in addition to biodiversity loss, uh, dealing with these problems, you know, the, the consolidation of corporate control over the food supply, these are really um, heavy things. Um, but I, I think to, to remind us that history needs to do the positive work of moving us forward, um, I think was really important to me. And that reminds me also, I think something else that I, I hope it, the book does for some readers, at least, you know, I, I, uh, the more I study the global food system, the more I realize I don't know about the things that I eat <laughs> every day, um, corn, corn among them. And so um, I hope there's also something um, for for some readers, at least, I know many will come with even greater expertise than than I bring to it here. Um, but appreciating uh, what what a global staple crop uh, can be, uh, and and the role that it's played in um, uh, in different cultures, but also in in different areas of of biological research, for example, um, and linking you know that history to then the the tortilla in your in your uh, next taco dinner. I think that's also uh, 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 something that I really hope the book does. Definitely does. I mean, personally, for me, I had purple um, maize chips at the weekend, and I was able to confidently give a little bit of a brief history about them, um, having read your book. So it was, uh, yeah, I was bragging, I think, a bit of that. Um, that's wonderful. That's excellent. And I think what the book does fantastically is really illustrate all of the um, all of the varieties and you know, the technologies that fit into this book with the images that you've chosen. And I was hoping you could talk a bit about where you found those images um, and how you think they bring the story to life. I remember one particular one that I enjoyed was the different varieties of the maize um, corn cob. And it just really demonstrated how different these varieties are. Um, so yeah, to speak more about that. Yeah, well, I should say, uh, and here I owe a, a, a great thanks um, to the Rockefeller Archive Center. Um, uh, a lot of the images from the book, or, or I guess um, I wouldn't know off the top of my head exactly how many, but 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 several of them certainly are um, from the collections uh, of the 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 Rockefeller Foundation, um, which had uh, some significant programs of maize development and conservation, um, not only in Mexico, but um, elsewhere in uh, Central America, uh, and then a, a bit in, in South America as well. Um, and they reflect obviously only a part of the story, the part of the story that a foundation funding development work wanted to tell about, about maize diversity and maize development. Um, but I think they do uh, provide a sense of the kind of on the ground science and conservation activity um, that was that was happening in in different places. Um, and yeah, the the images I I I tried to select things that I thought would um, especially shed light on different kinds of practices of conservation and, and research around diversity, um, which took different, different shapes at different times from, you know, what are the, the, well, um, the, the tools of exploration. So I have, uh, the ethnobotanist Hugh Cutler and his wife, Marion getting into a canoe, uh, in South America as they, they travel, um, in, in search of, uh, maize diversity to, uh, Edgar Anderson, um, measuring, you know, corn cobs in order to precisely chart the genetic 
the distribution of their genetic qualities. Uh, two, as I've said, the Rockefeller Foundation researchers um, in context working with scientists in, in Mexico and elsewhere um, to try and, and work with maize diversity. Um, two, the kind of flow charts and diagrams of the, of the information age in which genetic resources are partly thought of as information that must be correctly managed and transferred and, and curated from site to site. Um, and then I think some of the, the final images are really about um, in situ conservation, the, um, the work that uh, social scientists going into different sites, uh, hoping to engender conservation practices and activities uh, carried out uh, uh, in um, the 1990s and later. Um, and I should say, I thanked the Rockefeller Foundation, but there are actually um, some incredible um, people who, who shared materials with me. So some uh, one of the social scientists who was working on a project called Project Milpa um, uh, shared uh, generously shared photographs with me. Um, uh, researchers working in Mexico uh, at the um, Colegio de Postgraduados, uh, where one of my main actors um, did most of his teaching and research, dug up old file covers of, of photographs to, to sustain them. So that's an area where I, I really... Um, uh, um, and deeply grateful for the, the labor of others. Yeah, it sounds like such a fantastic archive trip um, and research project. Was there anything particularly interesting that you found in the archives or something that you didn't know about maize before that you'd like to leave the listeners with? Oh, that's a great question. Um, no, I mean, I think, I think what I would say is that, yeah, this... Um, uh, this project, uh, which didn't start out, as I mentioned, as a book about maize, um, but which is obviously deeply immersed in that world. Um, I guess what it led me to discover uh, is just the incredible uh, network and richness and depth of scholarship on maize from a variety of uh, perspectives. Uh, it really is... Um, kind of incredible and humbling uh, to, to um, I feel like at every turn, uh, because, the, because the book deals with different sites um, and different domains of science um, and different cultures, you know, every turn was again being humbled um, by uh, uh, the extent of, of my ignorance um, about, uh, about a crop that I thought I was getting to know more about over time. Um, and that one of the great uh, joys as well, in addition to those who, who really helped with the photographs, was um, um, meeting especially the different maze researchers working today, um, learning about the history of uh, maze science through their eyes um, and learning about the kind of importance of the things that they, they continue to do. And, um, and that, yeah, I think that that... Uh, the living archive, uh, I would say, uh, was probably the most extraordinary uh, piece to encounter. Brilliant. And uh, just finally, if you could give us an idea of what you're working on next. Absolutely. I would be so delighted. Um, uh, a question that every every scholar loves to, loves to have. Um, I am currently the PI of a multi-researcher, multi-year project called From Collection to Cultivation, Historical Perspectives on Crop Diversity and Food Security. And that is based at the University of Cambridge, where I, where I used to work. And the project is really, um, so here's one way to explain it. What I said at the beginning, that my work has especially been focused on plant breeding, biotechnologies, um, uh, and, and crop science um, a bit more generally. I, I've really been focused on genetics and breeding as this sort of key element in understanding how crops come to be. Um, but one of the things I learned in writing Endangered Maze, interacting with some of these scientists I just described, was just how, how much work beyond genetics and breeding matter in the creation of crop varieties um, for cultivation, for our dinner plates, uh, ultimately. And so the project is really meant to um, bring together historians with different expertises and interests to tell histories about uh, crops that 
decenter genetics and breeding uh, that really think about the whole range of different knowledge and labor and technologies that come to bear uh, on on crop development. And so that ranges from things like curation and database management in seed banks to um, plant health protection. So uh, establishing quarantine measures and regulations um, and, and, and managing those um, through the kind of whole gamut of uh, different kinds of activities that uh, researchers uh, do in the interests of uh, developing and disseminating, uh, yeah, basically the, the the foods that we eat that make it to our dinner table at the at the end of the day. Um, so that's my my main uh, enterprise at the moment. Sounds absolutely fantastic! Can't wait to see more things coming out of that. Thank you so much for joining us, Helen. It's been absolutely fantastic to have you on the show. It's been a real pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs>